go. Hey, Drew, you there? I'm here. Okay, very good. Now, I have um, the PowerPoint up. Should I, um, can you see it? Not yet. Okay, we got it. Okay, now am, am I going to be clicking the PowerPoint or are you going to be? You're going to be clicking the PowerPoint. Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of Caregiver's Corner. Today we have Drew Yanakis who, with us who will discuss SSDI strategies. Drew is a disability claims specialist from Charlottesville, Virginia. If you attended the most recent HDSA convention in Raleigh, you may have attended the workshop Drew offered with his colleague Ken Cady on this topic. Before I hand the webinar over to Drew, I'd like to take a moment to review how you can ask a question and how to view this webinar again after it's broadcast. Questions will be answered after the presentation. However, you may send a question any time during the presentation. To send a question, go to the control panel that appears on the right side of your screen. There'll be a panel for typing in a question. After typing a question, hit the Send button. You can send as many questions as you like, but please make sure that they are unique questions so that we can give everybody an opportunity to talk about a new topic. Drew, can we go to the next slide, please? After the webinar is broadcast, you can view it again in about 48 hours by going to the HDSA national website. To access the presentation, go to www.hdsa.org and scroll down the home page until you come to the link for the webinar. If you're interested in viewing any of our older webinars, which include how to talk to your doctor, your loved one's doctor about Huntington's disease, and coping strategies for caregivers, you can see them in the viewing in the Living with HD section on the national website. If you have a friend or a family member who is unable to join us, please be sure to give them the link for this webinar so that they can take advantage of the valuable information that Drew will be presenting today. It's with great pleasure that I now present Drew Yanakis and SSDI Strategies. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us, and thank you for having me on the uh, webinar. This is my first one, so I hope everything goes pretty smoothly. Uh, basically, I want to start out with uh, giving you all an idea of exactly what's involved in the process of applying for disability. There are quite a few levels of uh, appeals that you can go through um, if you are denied and um, if um, you need to continue to proceed with your claim. The first initial claim normally is taking anywhere between three to five, seven months, depending on where you are in the country. There's unfortunately a very large backlog and things are just very, very delayed. So it's very important to file your application uh, very carefully. And we'll get into some of the tricks of the trade as to how to do a successful application. If you're denied on your initial claim, you can file for a reconsideration. And there again, that's still taking another five to six months on top of the initial period. After that, you would have the opportunity to go to the administrative law judge where you would be able to discuss your case one-on-one -on -one with the judge and um, hopefully obtain an approval at that point. Unfortunately, with the administrative law judges, it's taking anywhere between a year and a year and a half just to get to the judge for a hearing. And then the decision could actually take another two to three months later. Therefore, one of the main things I stress to all of my claimants is to not apply too early and make sure that there is enough medical evidence to meet or equal a listing for disability before you even make your first initial claim. Initial claims are approvable, and people are approved on their initial claim all the time. It mainly depends on how much medical documentation is submitted when you make your claim. In filing your application, uh, if you do this online or if you do it in person with a Social Security representative or if you have a representative or attorney assisting you, it is very, very important to honestly and accurately answer all of the questions to the best of your ability. 
is a very difficult process to have to uh, admit to a lot of the aches and pains and the problems that you're having with daily life and with your ability to work, cognitive issues and physical issues. But it's so important to take the time and really spell out in writing how things are and how bad things are uh, with your health and in your condition. And if you're a caregiver, it's very important to help the, the claimant uh, understand that you, know, we, you need to really uh, pick the worst day and the worst scenario that you have during the day to write down on the application. Everything in your application has to correspond with what you tell your doctors. The medical evidence is what really makes or breaks a case. You need to also make sure that all of your doctors are listed, not just your HD doctors. Any doctor that you are seeing, other than, of course, an eye doctor or a dentist, unless you have uh, very poor vision, is very, very important because they will be contacting all of your medical professionals. And where you might not meet or equal one portion of the listing, you could possibly meet or equal a broader sense of all of the listings and might be able to get uh, disability through what's called a reduced functional capacity. We'll get into that in a few minutes. Listing your medications is also another very important uh, process in this uh, application. Even if you're getting just headaches or nausea, even if you're repeating yourself after each medication, the side effects are so important to list very um, in detail so that the examiner will know that you are having problems possibly from your medication and the side effects that are causing you possibly fatigue, that could be causing you discomfort, anything you can write down that will accurately depict your entire situation, the better. When you're doing your application, feel free to repeat yourself and answer each question, both on the, the mental and the physical and the daily living side of the questions. Make sure that you, you repeat yourself and you keep reiterating that the same problem is affecting you throughout your daily life. And it's very, very important to answer each question independently of the other questions on the application as if they've never been asked. Documentation is, the, is like 99% of your application for Social Security Disability. Your doctors need to be recording any and all of the changes you're having in your life. You need to be very, very honest with your doctor and make sure that your doctor is recording the changes and even the little ones. Uh, slight chorea movements will eventually possibly become um, greater than they were last year. Uh, your mental health situation and your cognitive abilities really need to be recorded by the doctor so that the uh, examiner at Social Security will have a really good picture of what's going on and how you're doing. If you feel that you're being rushed, and I know a lot of people tell me that when they go to the doctor they don't have a lot of time to sit and talk, it's very important that you, you explain to the doctor that you know, this is your time and that you really need to spend the time with your doctor discussing all the changes. It's also a very good idea to keep a log and possibly even have a caregiver go with you when you go to the doctor. I know myself and family members and the patients that I work with every day, the hardest thing to do is remember everything that's gone on in the last three or six months to remember to tell the doctor. And if your doctor is very busy, you can even talk with the nurse and go into more detail with the nurse and have her write or he write um, the information down and allow the doctor then to read it at their convenience and then that could become another medical document that could help prove your case. The biggest problem that I see every day is, you know, the doctor walks in and you say, how are you? And you say, oh, I'm fine. And they write down on the medical record, well, they said they're fine. And you're really not. It's very important to be careful that your, your 
and condition is medically documented every time you go to the doctor and you see the doctor. The functional capacity is, is a very important uh, entity in this whole uh, process also because they're evaluating whether or not you're able to sustain uh, gainful employment, what they call significant gainful activity in a six to eight hour day, five days a week. Monitoring and recording the changes in your capacity is very, very important. And these are both changes in your capacity physically as well as cognitively. Fatigue, memory, frustration, chorea, aches and pains, all of this will diminish your ability to maintain gainful activity at work. And having your doctor really identify the changes in your functional capacity is extremely important. If you're having trouble gripping or carrying or lifting or pushing or pulling, these things are very important to have evaluated by your doctor so that there is a medical document or medical testing done that will prove that you know, these conditions have been monitored and have been noted. The cognitive problems are, are uh, very important also because when you start losing your cognitive ability to function, um, sometimes they're very subtle, sometimes they're not. And it's important to let the doctor know, you know, every little problem that you're having cognitively. Uh, neuropsychological testing is also another really good way to show a decline in cognitive reasoning and executive functioning, etc. But the more evidence and the more written uh, statements from your doctor that you can get, the better. Uh, trying to explain to your doctor that you know your memory is going or that you're very frustrated and you're very tired and whatnot sometimes is a little bit difficult to uh, want to admit because everyone wants to be strong. And that's really good. What I tell people is you can be strong for every single hour of every day except for the half hour, 45 minutes you're with your doctor. And at that point you really do want to be brutally honest with the doctor and explain all of the changes that you're having in terms of functional capacity, both motor and cognitive. Um, I have here the listing of how Social Security will make a determination for people uh, with Huntington's Korea. And this is in the Social Security Blue Book that is online and is available for everyone to see. And I'm not going to go over the entire thing because it's quite lengthy, but I did want to you know, give you all the opportunity to know where in the listing the uh, conditions are that will warrant disability and the different uh, criteria that Social Security evaluates. As you can see, there are two distinct ways of getting disability with Huntington's. One is with motor function and one is with chronic brain syndrome. There's also a third, which we'll get into in a little while, called mixed dementia, which is a, another uh, disease that uh, Huntington's has been added to the listing for what's called a compassion allowance, which is basically an automatic allowance for Social Security. And the mixed dementia information is available online also in terms of how to meet or equal the listing. But when you're looking at the, uh, the listings, we'll start off with the motor functions. It gets very complicated because it goes into a whole lot of different things. It's not just a career movement. It's not just your inability to walk or to ambulate without assistance. It goes into quite a lengthy uh, description of all the different impairments that you would have to meet or equal. And here you'll be able to get an idea of why it's so important to have your doctor maintain the medical records of your functional capacity so that you can show the different um, uh, problems that you might be having to meet the motor coordination uh, listing. Um, in the uh, cognitive problem, it's equally as mind-boggling to figure out how to get disability based on this. And the 
the criteria is uh, rather lengthy, and you'll see as the slides uh, continue to move along. The psychological and behavior abnormalities are uh, very important to have documented both by neuropsych testing as well as documentation from your doctor. And also observations from your caregivers, your family, your friends, even your employer who has noted that you know things have changed and that you're not able to um, continue maintaining uh, a normal uh, act normal activities in the first section of the listing is also showing some of the specific cognitive abilities that need to be affected and if you uh, read over these carefully when you can go back on the website or go on Social Security site, you're going to see that a lot of it is subjective. And especially you know, when you have changes in personality, there's not going to be a day that you go from being one person to another. These are very subtle changes. And the more information and the more documentation that you have available to Social Security will uh, help them determine whether or not these conditions are number one going to last um, forever and number two that they are significant enough to keep you from being able to uh, maintain uh, a work environment. And this just you know goes on uh, with explaining about your intellectual abilities, your IQ dropping, and your restrictions and activities of daily living. We'll get into the daily living and the social functioning in just a moment, but I do want to finish going through the listing. As you can see, it's, it's quite long. And it also is looking at periods of uh, more than a year or two of problems. It's not a situation where you could go to the doctor and say, well, yesterday, I had this problem and tomorrow I'll get disability. They are looking to see how long these um, problems have been occurring and for how long they anticipate them to continue. Mixed dementia is a um, relatively new listing that has now been granted a compassionate allowance. And upon medical evidence that indicates that the patient does have uh, mixed dementia, Benefits are approved uh, almost without delay. The process is exactly the same. You still would go to Social Security or your representative to file for disability. And upon them realizing that you do have mixed dementia, the case would be expedited through disability determination and normally will be approved within two or three days. Uh, and then come back down to the Social Security office. Uh, mixed dementia is right now the only compassionate allowance that is available for people uh, with Huntington's disease. The questionnaires will be sent out to you, and this is probably one of the most important aspects of applying for disability. Social Security will send you out a barrage of questionnaires about your daily life, about pain, um, about your cognitive ability and how you spend your time and, and what you do all day uh, and if you're able to work or not. When you're filling out these questions, it's very difficult, I know, to sit down and, and write out uh, everything that you can't do. And that's unfortunately what these questionnaires really need to, uh, to address. The questionnaires are rather redundant while you're going through them. There's uh, sections of it that uh, pertain to the same issues. And it's very important to be consistent through all of the questions that you're being asked by Social Security. Uh, remembering uh, with motor coordination, for instance, one of the things that I notice a lot of times is one of the questions is, uh, do you have trouble dressing? And most people put no. And then you get to the other section and it says, are you able to bend, squat, push, or pull? And you say no. So the question then is, how would you be able to get dressed if you are not able to bend down and push and pull and do other activities like that? So it's very important to 
answer these questions very, very carefully and very honestly and as accurately as possible. And it's also a very good idea to have your caregiver or uh, your significant other or spouse uh, to help you with the uh, questionnaires so that even if you're not aware of certain things, they might help you become aware of them or might help you remember uh, that you are having a little bit more problem than not with certain aspects. You can write as much as you want, and I, I encourage people to write this out longhand and to really go into a lot of detail. This is your opportunity to be able to uh, tell the examiner exactly how life is for you. Uh, you do have all of your medical records showing you know, your declines and your, your strengths and your weaknesses. This is your chance to explain to them what your day is like and how hard things are. Uh, one good example, and I, I've just completed an application for a claimant who basically said, you know, I'm still doing relatively okay, but she said, I can't remember how to work the remote control. And little things like that where you have to study like a remote control to remember how to operate it, even if it, it's a delay of five or six seconds to try to remember how to do it, that is a significant cognitive change that needs to be written down. None of the information that you would write on a social security application would be shared with anyone other than your representative um, or an examiner or a doctor at social security. The information is sealed. Therefore, you don't need to worry about you know, writing down too much and feel that you might possibly lose your freedom, your driver's license, whatever. It's um, a very, very closed environment when it comes to all the information you're submitting. submitting. Another very important aspect of the questionnaires is they do send out what's called a third-party questionnaire that would go to your uh, significant other, your spouse, your caregiver, whoever you would like to be able to participate in identifying your shortcomings or longcomings with uh, Social Security benefits. It's um, very important to have someone who knows you very well fill out these forms from their perspective of how you're doing and also identify how often and, and how involved they are in your life. Uh, you can also have a third party questionnaire pulled offline. It's under forms on the Social Security website. And even if Social Security does not uh, ask for more than one or two people to participate in the third party report, you can send in as many as you want. And I do suggest that anyone who's actively involved in your care or in your life for that matter who is seeing the struggles that you might be going through right now, it's very important to have them documented also. The uh, uh, main synopsis of all this is it's very important to both document personally and through your third party people as well as your doctor and your nurse to make sure that everything is uh, written out and basically all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. The uh, biggest reason a lot of cases are denied on the initial claim is because there's not enough evidence to document that you are not capable of doing any significant gainful activity. One thing to always remember when you're applying for disability is Social Security does not necessarily look 100% at what kind of job you've had and what kind of job you've done or how much money you were making. What they are evaluating is whether or not you could sustain any type of work, even if it's sedentary. Sedentary work means that you would not have a lot of the physical aspects of running around an office, um, lifting, carrying, uh, possibly moving boxes or stuff like that. So when you're applying for disability, even if you're not able to do the job that you've been doing, you also have to show that you are not able to be doing any job that would be in the national 
economy, not just necessarily in your neighborhood. Uh, here in Virginia, we've got a lot of rural areas, and um, as probably everyone knows, nationwide we have a pretty high unemployment rate. And people are saying, well, there's no jobs that I can do and or could get. And not being able to get a job is one thing, but being able to do a job is another. And when you're applying for disability, we want to show that you are not able to do any job in the national economy based on a physical or a cognitive issue. Um, and that's sometimes not very easy to to document and to understand, but it's unfortunately the way the, uh, the laws are written. So the main thing to remember is to document and to make sure that your uh, medical evidence is supporting all of the claims that you're making in terms of your physical capacity. Uh, backing up just a little, one other uh, issue I wanted to bring up about actually filing the claim is you want to also remember if you do go to a reconsideration or to the administrative law judge to be consistent in the application process and really review the first application that you made and make sure that there are significant changes that are taking place and making sure that you're documenting them on each step of the way. Uh, one other frustrating factor of this whole process is that each time you uh, file for an appeal, you do have to fill out all the questionnaires again. And you're basically starting over with a uh, slight edge because they already have your previous medical um, evidence. The uh, big thing to do is if you are denied, definitely appeal. It's uh, your right to appeal and to keep the process going in order to establish a, an onset date. When you are uh, filing your appeals, make sure that your, the reasons that you were denied are addressed in your appeal and that would also strengthen your application and add a little bit more oomph to your ability to prove that your disability is significant. It's a, a long and hard process, I understand that, uh, and it's sometimes a very frustrating process, but needless to say, it is a process that you can get through, and if you do need help, there are a lot of people out here that are more than willing to help you or offer you advice while you're uh, filing and applying for benefits. The um, documentation I can't stress enough as being one of the most important factors in getting your Social Security benefits. Unfortunately, the listing of Huntington's disease and just having a diagnosis of Huntington's disease is not a disabling factor to Social Security. It has to have you know, all of the other uh, criteria as shown in the listing slides um, to help prove that the HD has caused you to get to the point where you do have a uh, declining physical functional capacity. Uh, if you do wind up going all the way to the administrative law judge, you uh, will have now probably been in the social security system for close to three years. And when you get to the judge, the major difference between that and being with uh, social security disability determination is the judges are allowed to go into the gray area of your medical background just a little bit more than the uh, examiners are. The judge will ask you a lot of questions and the judge will also um, provide you with the opportunity to really explain in detail uh, how things are. And plus he gets the visual component of seeing who you are, how you look, and, and how you're functioning. The judges are uh, quite experienced in dealing with disabilities and luckily every day that we take someone to the um, hearings that has HD, the judges are understanding more and more about the ramifications of the disease. And there again, it's very important when you're speaking with the judge or with anyone in Social Security to really uh, explain in detail every aspect of your decline, even the little ones. And the more that you've got documented, the better. 
uh, I think that uh, sums it up uh, on my end pretty well. And if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to start uh, addressing some of your questions that you might have uh, concerning your case. Thank you, Drew. That was a really terrific uh, presentation. We do have some uh, questions that have been uh, sent to us. So what we're going to do now is send the questions over to you, Drew, and then um, you can answer them as, uh, as you get them. Drew, are you getting the questions? Drew, are you seeing the questions pop up? Yes, I am. Okay. Am I, am I on? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, first question is an interesting question about uh, what has been done to extend disability benefits for those of us who already have Social Security benefits because of our age. I'm 67 and no longer able to get state disability due to the one-year maximum. Unfortunately, once you turn 65, your Social Security disability benefits will convert to Social Security retirement and your Medicare would go into effect at that point. There is no provision for Social Security disability uh, over the retirement age as of right now, and I do not believe, from what I've been told, that there will be um, any change to that. Uh, the next question is that you, someone had a client who was approved for SSDI, but Social Security changed the disability date by five months. When they called Social Security, they said we could appeal the onset date. He is due to receive benefits beginning in October. If we appeal just the date of onset, will this hold up the entire process? That's a very good question, and I've been coached by a lot of judges and a, a lot of disability determiners on this. When you appeal uh, an onset date or you appeal any decision, a brand new decision will be made. And if you appeal at the level of the administrative law judge, the entire case would be re-looked at. So if you are going in for a change in onset date, um, you want to be very careful that there is enough medical documentation that you would at least still meet or equal the listing on the date that you already had. Um, when you appeal, you cannot just appeal the onset date. You basically are appealing the medical determination of your disability. So you want to make sure that you've got your ducks in a row before you go and appeal the onset date. Uh, no, it will not affect the benefits starting. And if you are appealing, your case would still be adjudicated as or uh, processed through as a allowance by Social Security and you will go into payment. If at the time that they do the appeal and they make the determination that you are not disabled, then your benefits would stop. If they make the determination that the onset date change would be justified, then of course your benefits would be retroactive. But during the appeal process, you uh, will be on benefits as if you had not appealed. The um, uh, I have taken quite a few people to the administrative law judge and have also appealed onset dates to disability determination. And the one thing that I try to do and encourage people to do is make sure that there is 
either new or additional medical evidence that can uh, be attached to it so that when they do go and do the review that you do not have the possibility of losing the benefits you've already been uh, awarded. Uh, the next question is, um, what are the main qualification requirements to even submit an application? There, um, first off, number one is you have to have a medically determined uh, condition and that your medically determined condition is going to cause you the inability to maintain uh, significant gainful activity. The other qualifications are financial. And there's two different kinds of Social Security disability. There's what's called Supplemental Security Income, or SSI, and there's SSDI. SSDI is um, Social Security Disability Income, and that's based on the quarters that you've paid in to the system. And to determine whether or not you've paid in enough quarters into the system, you can contact your local Social Security office and ask them if you were to apply for disability how much you would be able to get based on your onset date from when you were unable to continue to work. SSI is a little bit different. SSI is, is based on finances and it is um, more of a welfare type program. If you have no income or very low income in the household and if you have low assets or no assets, you may qualify for SSI. Uh, Basically, the rule of thumb is if you had one house, one car, those are exempt, and you would qualify for SSI. If you are single and have less than $2,000 in the bank, you could also qualify for SSI. When you get into uh, deeper finances like 401ks, retirements, boats, additional properties, uh, these will be evaluated by Social Security to determine your eligibility for that program. Keep in mind, though, that if you do have a limited um, assets and limited income and that you are also eligible for SSDI, you might still want to apply for SSI because the SSI will pay you during the five-month waiting period that you are waiting for your Social Security benefits to begin. One other uh, uh, disclaimer I might throw out there is with SSI. SSI would be paid starting the month after your application. So it would be on the first day of the month after you file your application. Whereas Social Security disability determinations are made based on the onset date of your disability. Therefore, you could wind up getting back pay on SSDI, but your back pay for SSI would only start on the day that, uh, the first day of the month after you receive, uh, make your application. And the next question is right along with that one about how to determine how much money you'll receive. It, it's a convoluted, um, factor and unfortunately it's not anything you can sit down on your calculator and figure out. Um, most people do receive a yearly statement from Social Security that will um, tell you what you would be eligible for should you become disabled. And if you are going to retire you know, in X number of years, if you don't have that form, I would recommend you contacting your local Social Security office in your hometown and ask them if you were to file for disability, what would your benefit amount be? It is very, um, it's uh, totally determined based on how much money you've paid into the system and what your assets are. The next question is, so a housewife or limited work spouse has no chance of getting SSDI, not even based on working spouse's quarters. That's a, a yes and a no question. Um, if if a, let's see, how do I want to explain this? If somebody has been at home caretaking or just at home not working or has very limited work, the only time that you can go off of your spouse's earnings is if you, your spouse is disabled or deceased. And depending on the household income would be depending on whether or not 
the spouse would be eligible for SSI. The SSI requirements, you know, are are based on the finances in the in the household. However, they're uh, discounted if you are not the wage earner. So there again, if you are of low income uh, and you have never paid in, but your spouse does make some money, I would recommend it. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. I would recommend um, just contacting Social Security and telling them what your gross household income is, the number of children in the household, etc., and go from there. Uh, the next question is, is there a difference between what, what one would receive on retirement or with a disability? If you can't hold out working and not be terminated, fired, is there an advantage to waiting? Uh, yes, there is an advantage to waiting because if you are able to work and Social Security realizes that you're able to work, you'll probably be denied benefits anyway. Um, as each year goes on and you pay into the system, you are paying in a little bit more towards a disability paycheck and or a retirement paycheck. Um, if you retire early and become disabled, you are able to overwrite the retirement income that you got by your disability. Therefore, your retirement income when you turn 65 would go up instead of being on a reduced amount that you would get at 62. Um, I'm not totally clear on exactly how this question is going, but if you receive your retirement and your disability payments are relatively the same. Your SSDI would be slightly lower depending on your income levels. There again, that would be a question that I would definitely suggest you contact your local office and have them uh, look at your particular case individually to determine how all well that would work. Most people that are on uh, disability when they do retire normally don't even see a change. And that would be people that have been uh, deemed disabled prior to 62. Uh, one advantage if you are 62, between 62 and 65, if you are disabled and have taken early retirement, you will be able to get a little more money on retirement if you are found disabled during that period. Uh, apply there again on the same question. Uh, we're, we're asking about if you hold out working and not be terminated or fired, is there an advantage to waiting? Or should you go ahead with the application just in case things go wrong? Unfortunately, Social Security is not a um, either or. Uh, in most cases, people that are deemed disabled uh, are not capable of working or at the moment of their disability determination are not capable of working even though they might be able to go back to work at some time in the future. Um, if you are currently working and you are doing your full job and you are uh, maintaining an income, you would not be eligible to apply for benefits uh, because you are still significantly gainfully employed. If your job has changed dramatically, and if you are finding that out of 100% of your job, you're only able to do 10 or 15% of the job, then it might be an interesting idea to discuss with a, uh, a Social Security Disability Specialist whether or not you might be able to write off some of your uh, work, uh, work history because you're not actually earning and maintaining your full pay. If you wind up being on sick leave, family medical leave, or you are on um, vacation pay for periods of time, that is not considered significant gainful activity if it's related to your uh, disability. 
So if you are out of work for a period of time but you are still on the books or you're still receiving income but it's not earned income, you would then be eligible and you should at that point apply for benefits uh, and start proceeding in that direction. And I think that's the last question that I'm seeing. Okay, you do have, for those who are still with us on this webinar, we do have a few more minutes, so if you have any kind of follow-up question or if something has occurred to you, you know, go ahead and send us your questions. We'll be on the air for, well, let's say another three or four minutes, and if nothing comes in, then we'll, we'll say goodbye to Drew. But let's see if there's anybody else out there that has uh, some, some final question. Okay, and in the meantime, um, I'll continue to talk because there's still you know, so much to discuss when it comes to applying for disability. The one thing that I stress uh, very, very, very much is don't apply too soon, mainly because if you are denied and as you're pending your reconsideration and you're pending to go to the administrative law judge, a lot of time is passing that and your condition is probably going to be getting worse and you don't want to find yourself uh, very disabled while you're still fighting through the reconsideration processes because you started out too soon. Okay, let's see. Uh, the question is, is there a waiting period between the time Social Security finds you disabled and the payment starts? That's a, a two-fold question. There is a five-month waiting period for Social Security disability for, from the day that you are deemed disabled by disability determination and the day you go into Social Security payment. So if you, for instance, are found disabled on January the 1st of 2010, you would then be eligible for your first payment in June, which would be paid in July because Social Security pays one month in arrears. Um, if Social Security finds you disabled today and you are outside of your waiting period, there is a slight delay for the payment to start because of the processing time through the payment center. And that could be, you know, anywhere from, you know, a week to three weeks before you would see uh, your first check. But in that, with that particular question, it really depends on what your onset date is as to when your payment would actually start. But keep in mind, if you are not eligible for SSI, you'd have the five-month waiting period. If you are eligible for SSI, your SSI would start the month after your application. One other thing to consider is if you stopped working, let's say, in January and you are found to be disabled in February, and you are not eligible for SSI, you would still have that five-month waiting period where you are deemed disabled, and Social Security is looking at you as a disabled American. However, you would not receive payment for that five-month period. Uh, next question is a, is a good one. What if you are employed as an independent contractor making around $400 a month? and don't have a regular job, can you still be approved? Uh, $400 a month is considered to be under the significant gainful activity uh, amount of money that Social Security would look at as a minimum. It's called SGA. And right now that's $1,000 a month. Um, the question is, um, can you still be approved? It is still going to depend on how many hours you're working what your medical evidence shows, and how um, significantly you're affected by HD. And there again, that would be going back into evaluating everything by the listings and what the doctors are saying. If you are significantly um, disabled and you are unable to continue to do the type of work you were doing as an independent contractor, uh, yes, you could still be approved. And yes, you could probably still earn around the $400 a month even when your benefits start. The only problem is it becomes a little touchy that if you are working and you are able to work, 
then you have to prove that the work you're doing is not significant. The uh, next question is that I was unable to continue with my last job. Fortunately, my boss was able to get me a job created that would suit me. How does that include as evidence? If he had not done that, I don't think I would still be employed. This is a, a very uh, good thing to bring up. And this happens to a lot of people where employers make some really wonderful uh, concessions for good employees so that they are able to basically maintain their uh, benefits and maintain their um, income while you're looking or while you're waiting for disability. Uh, that's going to be an, a very individualized concept. I do have success, have a lot of success with people who have changed jobs and have had their, their responsibilities reduced and major concessions made. Uh, and have been able to get them approved with an early onset date during that period. There again, it all depends on the percentage of work you're doing and a tremendous amount of factors that go into it to make that kind of a determination. Um, and also it depends on how much work you're actually doing and, and what kind of work you're doing, etc. So that's, that's really based on a, a, a very personal uh, aspect. I have uh, seen people with the same exact diagnosis with two separate employers, both making concessions. One can and one can't get disability because of their earnings. Um, you still have to prove that you are not capable of sustaining uh, gainful activity for you know a six or eight hour day. Uh, one clarification might be I did have a, a client that was taking 24 hours a day to do about seven hours worth of work because of fatigue. And the employer made concessions and allowed the, the patient to work from home. So where he was still doing seven hours of work, it was taking him 24 hours to do it because he'd have to sleep periodically to maintain a level of cognition. Um, that's one example of how that um, might work for you. Uh, the next question is, our son was deemed disabled at 46. Will his disability decline at 65, normal retirement age? I don't believe so. There again, it depends on what level of disability he's at and how many quarters he's paid in and what the long-term uh, situation is for him and how long he had worked previously. There again, that would be a very easy question to contact Social Security and just say, you know, here's what he's getting now. Will he be getting basically the same? I do believe for most people on disability that the, if there is a decline, then the disability amount would continue. But it all depends on how much you've actually paid in in the past. So once again, I think as we're getting close to closing, um, my main advice is get as much help as you possibly can to process your application. Make sure that your doctors are documenting everything and that your caregivers are going to be available to assist in um, helping with the questionnaires, etc., and to really you know, think long and hard and make sure you're not applying too early so that you don't wind up uh, having to go through the reconsideration process and that you could be de uh, dis deemed disabled on your first try. It's a very long and arduous process. So I wish everyone the best of luck. Thank you, Drew. That was truly a terrific webinar. I'm sure that those, of, those in attendance have learned an awful lot about SSDI and the strategies that they should be using when applying. Just to remind everybody, this webinar will be available on the HTSA National website in about 48 hours, and you can access the various parts that Drew has brought to our attention, both on his slides and in his audio, um, after that. Drew also did... And Jane, yes? Jane, one other thing. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to email me or feel free to call. 
I'm here to help anybody, and advice is something that is a, a very easy thing to give, and I'd be more than happy to talk to anyone. And of course, when you're giving advice, there is absolutely no cost whatsoever to anyone. So feel free, if you have additional questions, to call or uh, email me through HDSA. Thank you so much, Drew. And Drew's contact information, both his phone number and his email, are on the first, uh, I think, the third or fourth slide um, of the presentation. So when you go back to access it, you can easily copy down his information and his email. Drew, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing yeah, for having me. valuable information with us. This will conclude this edition of Caregiver's Corner. Thank you so much all for joining us. Goodbye.